I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This uncut comedy gym changed the way an entire generation looked at the art of funny. Adam Sandler's movies have brought millions of smiles to faces and millions of dollars to bank accounts, along with the hatred of a million hellfires from those cine-snobbish critics. But then every now and then this funny people person surprises those snobs with an art house masterpiece that would make every clown in the circus cry. Adam Sandler played on the edge of being a comedian and a motherfucking rock star. But the thing that makes Adam Sandler movies so special is that these silly little slices of cinema always have heart which has allowed Sandler's taste for the tasteless to span decades and generations. He represents freedom and fun. Remember when movies used to be fun? Oh my god, I am the winner. For years, it feels like Adam Sandler would deliver us masterpiece after masterpiece and blockbuster after blockbuster. But lately, it does feel a little bit like we have seen a different Adam Sandler. He is no longer the relatable doofus who lived in our VCRs in the 1990s. Now he mostly lives on Netflix, with an audience split on if he's truly 100% fresh. It seems like the movie Billy Madison may have come true. You know, that life-reflecting art kind of stuff. In our younger years, Sandler was the cool class clown who everyone wanted to party with. Now he's kind of the annoying older dude in the back of the class making lazy Boraville jokes. As half the world turns back and gives him the stink eye. I'm here to learn everybody not to make out with you. Go on with the chlorophyll. <laughs> but remember kids, no matter how dumb Adam Sandler's characters seem to be, in the end, they always win. So has Sandler's sense of humor finally run thin? Have we moved past the tomfoolery of the Happy Madison gang? Is Adam Sandler tired of movie making and just going lazily through the motions? Or is he trying something new and growing as an artist? Or all of the above. But basically all we really want to know is, what the f happened to Adam Sandler? But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Adam Sandler, we must start at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1966, Brooklyn. Sandler began performing stand-up comedy around New York when he was just 17, making a name for himself with a soft-spoken yet slightly awkward delivery. While perfecting his stage presence, he would build a decent resume by appearing in The Cosby Show, where he played Smitty, one of Theo's friends. From there, he would get to turn up the zany by playing Stud Boy on the MTV game show Remote Control. Adam Sandler would then get a taste for making vacation-themed movies when he co-wrote and starred in his first film, Going Overboard, in 1989. This had absolutely no budget, and apparently nobody liked it. This has been listed on IMDb, you know that one database, as the 15th worst film ever made ever of all time in history. Of course, Adam Sandler's biggest rise to fame came when Dennis Miller saw him perform stand-up and recommended him to Lorne Michaels for a spot on Saturday Night Live. Sandler was hired as a writer originally, and it wasn't until his second year at SNL that he was bumped up to Featured Player, where his musical segments on weekend updates such as the Thanksgiving song and of course the Hanukkah song made him a fan favorite. Hanukkah! Happy Hanukkah, everybody! Thank you! His popularity led to him becoming a full-blown cast member. He went on to create such memorable characters as the Hurley He Boy, Canteen Boy, Pepper Boy, Opera Man, 
the Zagat's Guide couple, and of course, the Gap Girls. Then he was fired from the show in 1995. He who lasts, lasts, lasts loudest. He. In 1993, he had a small role in the big screen adaptation of the Saturday Night Live classic sketch, Coneheads. And after Coneheads came Airheads, which is a great film that was actually really hated when it was first released. And it only grossed $5 million, which was half of its $10 million budget. Airheads is like Dog Day Afternoon, but at a rock and roll radio station. Okay. Get over there, please. Thank you. Sandler's star began to rise when he starred in a couple of low-budget comedies that would go on to have solid returns. First came Billy Madison. This was made on a modest $10 million and pulled in over 2.5 times that at the worldwide box office. Then the next year came Happy Gilmore, and that made even more money. So he was on a roll. But of course, critical reception for Billy Madison was mixed to negative, with most of those pesky film critics finding the movie to be a bit too dumb for its own good, but admitting that it will likely be a hit with its target demographic. And it was, because I was. Oh, really, fool? Really? <laughs> Stop looking at me, swan! While Happy Gilmore didn't fare much better with those same critics who found the humor a bit too juvenile. But these two characters right here, Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore, these two right here I say are the perfect Adam Sandler movie characters. Likeable, relatable losers who are filled with rage and love. Adam Sandler would receive his first in a long line of MTV Movie Awards for his performance in Billy Madison, and would go on to win the first ever award for Best Fight alongside Bob Barker. Of course, with Happy Gilmore and his follow-up performance in the film Bulletproof in 1996, he would receive his first of many Razzie nominations as well for Worst Actor. Whereas Bulletproof has become one of Sandler's more forgettable films, even though it is pretty good, it has some exciting moments. Will you shut the fuck up? Why don't you make me? Ah! Jeez, I gotta learn how to fight, this is pathetic. The year 1998 would be a big one for Adam Sandler as it was the year that he became an official true blue comedic movie star leading man when he proved that he was able to lead the wedding singer. It would be the first pairing of one of the greatest on-screen couples of our time, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. This right here made the world fall in love with Adam. He would then do a cameo in Norm MacDonald's hilarious comedy, Dirty Work. Then Adam would finish 1998 in strong form by playing the hydration specialist turned college football superstar in The Waterboy. This one right here made over $160 million becoming the first in a long line of his starring roles that would go on to gross over $100 million at the domestic box office. Yeah, this is when Adam started to make that serious money. And Adam Sandler is great. He took a real risk here and really dedicated himself to this uh, voice. And I think it works. And of course, he starred alongside Academy Award winner Kathy Bates who originally threw the script in the trash, but her daughter, who was a huge Adam Sandler fan, convinced her mama to become Bobby Boucher's mama. But of course, those pesky critics, they trashed the movie for its lowbrow humor. Yet some critics were able to see the film for what it ultimately was, a good-hearted and endearing film that was hard to resist. Yet again, Adam Sandler was nominated for a Razzie for Worst Actor. Although that was offset by his wins at the MTV Movie Awards and the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards for Best Actor, 
Haha! <laughs> Art, it's so subjective, you know? Bob Kitten! Looks like Boucher knocked him off pole! I love my mama very much. Now you know that. Sandler would reunite with his frequent collaborator, director Dennis Dugan, for his next massive box office hit, Big Daddy. The film would cost just $34 million and would go on to make a hefty $234.8 million worldwide. But yet again, those pesky critics, they found the humor to be too crude. But you know who loves the movie Big Daddy? Master filmmaker Paul Thomas Anderson, actually. Yeah, PTA, Big Daddy, it's one of his favorites. Yet again, Adam Sandler was both the best and the worst as he would take home several awards for his performance in this film, the Razzie for Worst Actor as well, as well as Best Actor, at the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards, the MTV Movie Awards, and the Kids' Choice Awards. Sandler would then go on to form his own production company, Happy Madison Productions, and he did this so that he could produce a starring role for his friend Rob Schneider. And that would actually be a smart move because Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, would go on to make nearly $100 million off a $17 million budget, paving the way for Happy Madison to bring us more of whatever it is they do. Ah. The year 2000 would bring us a new Adam Sandler comedy, and it's one that proved that sometimes bigger isn't always better. The film was Little Nicky which cost around 85 million to make, but only made 58 million back. Critics found the movie to be dumb and tasteless. Unfortunately, although it was a nice try, a good effort, this mess of a movie, Little Nicky, marked the end of the golden era of Sandler. <laughs> The Sandman would take it easy in the year 2001, appearing in a cameo on the show Undeclared, as himself, and another little cameo in the next Rob Schneider movie, The Animal, where Rob Schneider becomes an animal. So first, Sandler would produce the Dana Carvey-led Master of Disguise, as well as Rob Schneider's The Hot Chick, where Rob Schneider becomes a hot chick where he would also have a brief cameo as a crazy bongo guy. It's just it's wild and crazy. Little Nicky aside, Sandler had established himself as a solid box office performer, which led to Columbia Pictures giving him his next film, Mr. Deeds, which was a remake of the 1936 Frank Capra classic Mr. Deeds Goes to Town which was Adam Sandler's grandma's favorite film. He's such a grandma's boy. Mr. Deeds would go on to make over $171 million off a $50 million budget. Critics hated the movie, though. Was that awesome? Remember when I said that Big Daddy was one of Paul Thomas Anderson's favorite movies? Well, that paid off when PTA cast him in his Magnolia follow-up, Punch Drunk Love. The film gave Adam Sandler the chance to show the world the type of dramatic actor that he could be. Everybody loved seeing Sandler free from the constraints of the formula that he usually follows resulting in surprising depth from the actor. Adam Sandler would leave the Razzies behind and be nominated for the prestigious Golden Globe Award for his performance. Well, are the Golden Globes even still prestigious anymore? I, I, don't, I don't even know. But they were at the time. So no matter what, it's still pretty wild to be able to say out loud that Adam Sandler was nominated for a Golden Globe and deserved it. I sometimes cry a lot for no reason.
But yes, under the careful direction of Paul Thomas Anderson, Adam was able to perfectly play this vulnerable, lovesick enigma that is Barry. And it's freaking beautiful. He's still awkward and still able to snap with furious anger at any moment, but still seems like a harmless teddy bear at the same time. The world was now ready to take Adam Sandler serious. And then came Eight Crazy Nights. This animated film was bred from the Hanukkah song. Many critics called this one unwatchable and a waste of time. And the movie didn't do too well at the box office, pulling in just $23.8 million off a $34 million budget. And I'm sure a couple people thought this was going to become a holiday classic, but it just didn't work. I know some people like it, though. Are you one of those some people? Comment your comment in the comments. Smell you later, poopsicle. <laughs> The year 2003 would see Sandler produce his friend David Spade's film Dickie Roberts, former child star, and reunite with Paul Thomas Anderson for a short film called Couch. But his biggest output that year was teaming up with Academy Award winners Jack Nicholson and Marissa Tomei for Anger Management. The film would be another solid performer for Sandler and grossed nearly 200 million worldwide. Sandler and Jack Nicholson, they actually have some really good chemistry in this one. 2004 would see Adam Sandler reunite with his wedding singer muse Drew Barrymore for 50 First Dates. It has all that gross out humor and juvenile jokes and whatnot, you know, all the stuff I need, but there is a true underlining sweetness to it that elevates the material so it isn't just a forgettable comedy. Yeah, that's right, 50 First Dates is not forgettable. Audiences everywhere enjoyed the film and it made nearly 200 million worldwide. One, two, three. <laughs> Yikes, that's, uh, that's a lot of vomit. This is why I got into this business. Sandler would next be seen flexing more of those dramatic chops in the James L. Brooks film Spanglish. The film was actually a bit of a failure, only pulling in 55 million off an 80 million budget. Critics were put off by the sitcom vibe of the story structure. However, those same critics praised Adam Sandler's dramatic performance. He seemed to have the emotions of a Mexican woman. He would then tackle a remake of the classic Burt Reynolds football movie, The Longest Yard. The film opened at 47.6 million, making it Sandler's largest opening weekend to date. The Longest Yard would go on to gross an impressive 180 million worldwide. And it is still the highest grossing comedy remake of all time in all of history ever. But critics found that this remake did not stack up to the original. He would then star in a movie called Click, which is surprisingly clever and touching and thoughtful. The film was a massive hit pulling in 240 million, and many people appreciate how this film plays around with its outlandish concept. Like, I'm not kidding, Click kind of has it all. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry, and it'll make you think. No, 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 you got more. Then came 2007 and he would continue to bring tears to our eyes when he would star in one of the first films to use 9-11 as a backdrop for a completely fictional story in the film Rain Over Me. Critics really appreciated the underlining story of friendship and grief while unanimously praising Sandler's truly dramatic turn 
as a man who lost his family that fateful day. But for my money, Adam gives a full-on Academy Award-worthy performance in this one yet again. But the Academy seems to count Sandler out no matter how great he is. But no, you do not need to be awarded an unholy golden idol by your peers to be truly great, no. But it is worth mentioning that the Academy does seem to overlook comedians who take a dramatic dip. Sandler would then star in a movie that would have zero chance of being made today. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. Critics loathed the film, saying that it catered to the lowest denominator with its tasteless stereotypes. But I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry does have a B-plus cinema score and did make over 180 million at the box office. But yeah, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. If this was made today, it would get canceled before you can say I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. Sandler would spend 2008 producing Strange Wilderness and The House Bunny, along with starring in You Don't Mess with the Zohan. Critics called the film another mess from Sandler. The film was a financial success pulling in $204 million. And Adam showed the world that he could put on some muscle, which made me really look forward to him joining the cast of Inglorious Bastards as the Bear Jew. But that never happened. He would follow up with his first Disney film, Bedtime Stories. The film was expected to be a massive Christmas season hit, yet it stumbled behind Marley and Me and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. More people went to go see The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Of course, the box office is not a sprint, it's a marathon, and bedtime stories would eventually find its audience and make over $212 million. Oh yeah, and critics hated it, but at this point that's kind of just given for an Adam Sandler comedy. He would follow that up by starring in his old roommate Judd Apatow's film, Funny People, playing a semi-fictionalized version of himself, kinda, and Adam Sandler fully embraces making fun of his life and career. Funny People is actually a really great film, but it is a little too long, and that kept a lot of people from going to see it in theaters. In this movie, Funny People, it proves that with the right material, the right character, the right director, Adam Sandler can truly shine in a dramatic performance. This movie right here is Adam Sandler looking himself in the mirror and asking the question, who am I? And what does it mean to be a funny people? It's sad knowing Merman's crying inside. And so after Funny People came out, we were all kind of like, okay, Adam Sandler, he's self-aware, he knows where his career is going, and so he's probably gonna stop making those big, dumb, stupid movies, right? Now he has matured and he's going to keep doing things like Punch Drunk Love and Funny People. But actually, no, right after Funny People, he went right back to being Adam Sandler. And you know what? I'm totally fine with it. In 2010, we would only see one Sandler-involved film, Grown Ups. Yet that film would turn out to be his highest grossing live action film to date. The film would feature pretty much everyone Adam Sandler knew, which is actually a kind of nice thing to see because when you watch the film, you can see that everyone's actually having fun making a movie. And for me, I can appreciate that. However, those pesky critics apparently could not, and they gave the film hideous reviews saying, saying that all the funniest moments probably happened behind the scenes when the cameras weren't rolling. But none of that mattered because this movie would go on to make $270 million worldwide. Then came Just Go With It. The film's original title could also be Adam Sandler's philosophy to making movies, at first, it was called Holiday in Hawaii. Adam Sandler saw that title and was like, yeah, I'll do that one. <laughs> Just Go With It would go on to make $214.9 million. And it would give Sandler another statue for his shelf, a Golden Raspberry Award for the worst actor of the year. 
He would finish up the year 2011 by appearing opposite a man that many consider to be one of the finest actors of all time, Al Pacino, in a horrible, horrible mess of a movie called Jack and Jill, where he played Jack and Jill. Oh my God! Jack and Jill has gone down in Razzie movie history as the first film to ever sweep the awards winning every single award. Not every single award it was nominated for, every single award in every single category at the Razzies went to Jack and Jill. And many people consider this to be one of the worst films ever made. But yet, even with that, the film still managed to turn a profit, grossing $150 million off a $79 million budget. And that, right there, is the power of Sandler. He's so nice, you get him twice. And yeah, this feels like one of those fake movies that was in Funny People, but no, this is real. The Sandman would then kick off the year 2012 by producing and starring in That's My Boy. Critics called this one ugly, tasteless, and mean-spirited. It was also called pathetic and painful. And once again, Adam Sandler would receive some of that razzy love slash hate, taking home another statue for worst actor and worst screenplay. But That's My Boy could not recoup its $70 million price tag, only taking in $57.7 million. Which sounds like a lot if you don't have $57.7 million. Oh, let me jog your memory. <laughs> so what do you do when your box office clout is waning? You go and make an animated film for the whole family. That's what you do, and that's what Adam Sandler did. He went and voiced Dracula in Hotel Transylvania. The film would go on to gross 358 million worldwide, and would actually be nominated for Best Animated Film at the Golden Globe Awards. Blah, blah, blah. And since Grown Ups was Adam Sandler's biggest movie ever, he had to make a sequel, so then came Grown Ups 2. Critics slammed the film, because it's an Adam Sandler movie, once again nominating it for a shite ton of Razzies, including Worst Actor for Sandler. And it went on to make $247 million. In the year 2014, we would see Adam Sandler reunite with his muse, Drew Barrymore, for the romantic comedy Blended. And once again, he was nominated for Worst Actor at the Razzies. But once again, the movie would make a lot of money. He would then appear as himself in his buddy Chris Rock's film, Top 5, and return to some more dramatic stuff with the Jason Reitman film, Men, Women, and Children, and Tom McCarthy's The Cobbler. And even though these films represented his return to dramatic work, which we all love so much, these two films were actually widely panned. Then came those infamous Sony hacks. And we learned a lot about Adam Sandler's relationship with the studio and how the executives felt about him. They didn't like working with him. They didn't like his quote-unquote mundane movies. So I guess it kind of makes sense why Adam Sandler left the studio theatrical system behind and eventually found a home at Netflix. Becoming one of the first major stars to fully embrace the scary new world of streaming. Adam would then star and produce the high-concept film Pixels, and this movie right here, it cost a lot of money to make, and it didn't make a lot of money back, with only 78 million in receipts. But the foreign market did save Pixels from complete financial ruin. Yet those critics, they found the film to be garbage. And Pixels is actually a very important film in the career of Adam Sandler because, to this date, this is Adam Sandler's last live-action comedy to be released theatrically. Because soon after this, he signed a four-picture deal with Netflix. And that Netflix deal would begin with the Western spoof, The Ridiculous Six. This film has a rare 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, with critics calling it lazy and offensive. 
However, not long after the release of The Ridiculous Six, Netflix issued a statement saying that the film had been viewed more times in 30 days than any other film in their history. That means he likes you. 2015 would see Adam Sandler return as Dracula in Hotel Transylvania 2. And of course, this was another huge success with $475 million at the box office. 2016 would see Adam Sandler's second Netflix film, The Do-Over. Critics liked The Do-Over more than they liked Ridiculous 6, but that's not saying much getting 9% on those tomatoes at Rotten.com, And once again, Adam Sandler was called out for making movies in tropical locations as a way to get studio-funded vacations. In 2017, we would see two vastly different Adam Sandler films. The first would be a comical homage to his real-life manager. It's a film called Sandy Wexler. This would be his third Netflix film, but it was still kind of sloppy and a little too long. But it is very enjoyable, even though it does seem like a two-hour inside joke between Adam Sandler and his friends. Oh, I'm so happy, Sandy! I love you. This is your moment. This is all you. I'm just so happy for you and your wife and your kids. Okay, that's all. I love you. He would follow that up with another Netflix movie, but this was not part of his contract. This one came from respected filmmaker Noah Baumbach and was called The Meyerowitz Stories. New and selected. He had to just rely on his acting chops, and it's absolutely a glorious thing to watch. There's just something special to me about a comedian taking on a dramatic performance. It just makes it even more emotional. You know, like a tear from a clown. The Meyerowitz Stories, new and selected, would premiere at the Cannes Film Festival where it received a four minute standing ovation and was nominated for the palm de tour. What the fuck is wrong with you? I know it's hard. It's hard for all of us. Get it together. You are doing with Tony just what Dad did with me and Gene. Oh, ow. But then his next film was The Week Of. But unfortunately, many Sandler fans just did not connect with this one in any way. But the Sandman would bounce back theatrically when he released his highest grossing film to date, with the $528.6 million grossing Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. How funny is that? Finally, Adam Sandler is in a movie called Summer Vacation, and the only place he went is into a recording booth. Welcome to Hotel Transylvania! Sandler would then finish out the year 2018 by returning to his true roots, stand-up, and releasing a highly praised stand-up special, Adam Sandler, 100% Fresh. This special was universally loved by critics and audiences alike. And yeah, this is Adam Sandler's true return to form, showing us that he's funny. He's always been funny. He just needed to be in a better place to tell his jokes. And that place is on stage. In 2019, Sandler would reteam with his friend Jennifer Aniston for the Netflix comedy Murder Mystery. It's about a murder mystery. Critics found the film to be mediocre, which is actually kind of high praise coming from critics when it comes to an Adam Sandler comedy. And Netflix released a statement saying that Murder Mystery had been watched in nearly 31 million households in its first 72 hours of release, making it the biggest opening weekend for a film in the company's history. Adam Sandler would also return to the stages of Saturday Night Live for the first time since he was fired as a host. And that return got Adam Sandler an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Comedy Series. So yeah, lately it seems like Adam Sandler's been on fire. His most successful film ever, Hotel Transylvania 3, a highly praised comedy special, and a highly praised dramatic performance, a super successful Netflix movie, and an Emmy nomination for hosting Saturday Night Live. Like Adam Sandler was back, and just when you thought he couldn't get better, he blew your f***ing mind and starred in the film, 
uncut gems. I know, I know. I'm so sad, I'm so fucked up. That's right, 2019 would end on a high note for Adam Sandler. This film would be a triumphant return to his dramatic roles. Adam Sandler began receiving the highest praise he has ever gotten for this film, Uncut Gems. It's truly an amazing thing to watch. The tension in this fine film, it just builds and builds and builds, and Sandler's neurotic anger, pain, and panic, it just drives the film. This film and this performance is truly unlike anything I have seen in the movies in a really, really long time. The Oscar buzz for this film was out of control. Adam Sandler was basically a shoe-in. But then the morning of the nominees came and nothing, nada. But Sandler took the snub in stride with a comical self-mocking tweet that even Mama from Waterboy herself, Kathy Bates, joined in on, who was actually nominated that year. But it wasn't all bad news, though. The night before the Oscars, Adam Sandler picked up Best Male Lead at the Independent Spirit Awards, where he gave an absolutely hilarious speech. I'd like to also give a shout out to my fellow nominees, who will now and forever be known as the guys who lost to fucking Adam Sandler. <laughs> Uncut Gems would go on to make $50 million, becoming Studio A24's highest grossing release to date. And Sandler would also be nominated for the prestigious Razzie Redeemer Award. And this truly was a redemption. Why are you being so thick headed? I'm out! Fuck you, man. Suck my gut. Oh, we fuck the world. But don't you worry, because Adam Sandler would be nominated again in 2020 for Worst Actor at the Razzies for Hubie Halloween. This was the first film in Adam Sandler's renewed contract with Netflix, and it did receive better than average reviews for an Adam Sandler comedy, and many claim this to be Adam Sandler's best Netflix film to date, if you're in the mood for a fun Halloween flick. The thing that stands out most to me about Adam is that it seems like the fame and the fortune never changed him, never went to his head. I even noticed this as a kid, watching his hilarious acceptance speeches at the Kids' Choice Awards, and I admired that he dressed like me and my friends. He wasn't trying to be somebody else, he was just like, hey, yeah, I'm Adam, I'm just a guy, and I just happened to become a movie star. And of course they tried to cancel him, but didn't work. Everyone just seemed to shrug it off and Adam just kept on doing his thing. Not letting the nasty world of politics and cancel culture slow him down one bit. And I don't think I'm telling tales out of school here when I say that I'm a massive Adam Sandler fan. I can appreciate that he knows where his bread is buttered and goes back to that time and time again. Critics be damned. Because you know what? Here's a dirty little secret. Who gives a shit what the critics think? Except the critics at JoeBlow.com, of course. They know what they're talking about. The audience is there. People just like to watch Adam Sandler be Adam Sandler in Adam Sandler movies. Years from now, after the apocalypse, the aliens will be studying our culture and they will discover those old VHS tapes of Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore and The Waterboy. And those outer space historians will learn to appreciate that Adam Sandler and his crew of misfits brought the universe a whole new wave of surrealist comedy. Connecting us all through the universal language of LOLing. And yet those sillier Sandler films seem to be the reason that some of these cine snobs refuse to give Sandler the respect that he deserves. His dramatic turns have all been Oscar worthy. And for my money, there is no greater snub in Oscar history than Adam Sandler not receiving a nomination for Uncut Gems and Punch Drunk Love. Oh yeah, and, and Rain Over Me. And the Meyerowitz stories, too, I guess. Ah, shut up! 
And I genuinely hope that Adam Sandler continues doing what he's always done, making the movies he wants to make, bouncing back and forth between intense fart jokes and intense tear-filled monologues. He's a true artist who can do both. And I do want to continue to see Adam Sandler kill it in those dramatic roles. But I also sometimes just want to sit back and watch something funny and juvenile. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Adam Sandler. Because he's doing just fine. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.